Hello, my name is Gavin Edwards and I'm the first horn of the Hanover Band and recently we've been recording the full cycle of Beethoven symphonies which has been a great treat, especially for me as a natural horn player, natural horn and hand horn player. I feel that Beethoven's writing for this instrument in the orchestra is some of the finest ever. Technically it's a real challenge and stamina wise it's a real challenge but the sheer fun and musicality of it makes it really special and just wonderful. Now, this instrument I play in the orchestra is very similar to one that Beethoven, Mozart and Haydn would have known and written for, but a long time before then, as the hunting horn, it was much simpler. It didn't have this tuning slide or this hoop here, and it was held just with one hand, sometimes on horseback. This would leave the left hand free to hold the reins, and it would make hunting calls like this. <laughs> Now this is wonderful for what it was designed for, to send messages across the fields to other huntsmen. But if you wanted to play in a different key, you were a bit stuck. Until in 1740, a horn builder devised a system in which you could take a section out, add this, the coupler, and put this back. And now this has taken the instrument down one tone from F, in this case, down to E flat. And it sounds like this. <laughs> Now this was great news for the horn players because previously if you wanted to play in different keys you'd have to carry a separate instrument, a complete instrument for every key and that was a lot of work. And now all you had to do was have one of these and a series of crooks and couplers and you could play in whatever key you wanted. Now a few years later another builder added this section, the tuning slide. Now on these instruments this tuning slide is very very long which does make you wonder sometimes how bad was the situation before that was invented? Um, I prefer to think that uh, the tuning was pretty much spot on. Now this is the instrument developing. Also the players were tra tackling things, they're trying things out and they also found a new way of holding the horn, possibly at the behest of someone who said you're too loud, put a sock in it, there you go. put your hand in the bell. So you put the hand in the bell like this and if you did it too far like that they noticed that it changed the note like this. Now that could have been a disadvantage, but a player called Anton Hempel, uh, he put this together, he codified it into a new hand technique, and he showed that by putting the hand in the bell like this, this is the open position, then they're stopped, and then they're fully open sometimes, you can play a whole scale like this. <laughs> And with a bit more work, you can play a chromatic scale. Now this is really important for the horn because it brought it forward from just a hunting instrument into a really melodic chromatic instrument that could compete with the wind instruments quite happily. And Mozart knew about this. Uh, his friend, Ignaz Leutgeb, was a very, very fine horn player. And Mozart wrote five concertos for him. And in one section of the third concerto, he writes a particularly beautiful little passage which takes the instrument away from its home key through several arpeggios and eventually back to where it started again. Now that's a very beautiful piece of writing and Mozart really knew how to work this instrument. It's a bit of a shame though that he didn't employ so much of that kind of writing in his orchestral work. There's the odd moment here, little gems, but not very much. So going back to Anton Hempel, he had a really gifted pupil called Jan Vaslav Stitch. And Stitch worked for the Count von Thun in Switzerland. He played in the court orchestra and he wanted to go around the world and become famous. So he asked the Count if he could be given leave to travel to Europe. And the Count said, no, no, I've invested in you. I've paid for your tuition. You're my player. You'll stay in my orchestra. And Stitch wasn't happy with this. So he absconded with four of his friends and the Count was furious. And the Count was so angry, in fact, that he sent two of his soldiers to chase after Stitch around Europe with explicit instructions to punch his front teeth out so he can never play again. Now this forced Stitch to have to play concerts in disguise sometimes. On one occasion, he was just finished the concert, he had to run out the back of the concert hall as the soldiers were running in the front. 
and eventually he ended up down in Constantinople in the Holy Roman Empire, where he Italianated his name to Giovanni Punto. It's a normal translation from Stitch, Jan Stitch to Giovanni Punto. In England, he would have been Joseph Bridge. Now, Punto had become, through this and travelling around Europe, had become very, very famous. And so in 1799, he met up with the young Beethoven. There was 30 years difference in age between them. And Punto was the famous musician and Beethoven was just the young composer. And they decided to do some concerts together in which Beethoven was going to write a sonata for Punto to play. And that would all be that. Uh, the concert was all arranged, the tickets were being sold, but there was no sign of the sonata. And Punto was getting a little bit nervous. And in fact, it got so bad that the night before the concert, Punto went to Beethoven and said, please give me anything, anything. And Beethoven scribbled down a horn part and Punto learned it overnight, which I find absolutely astonishing. It's quite an advanced horn part. And uh, Punto was a fine musician, so no doubt he was up to it, but that is something special. The next day they played it with Beethoven improvising a piano part. And uh, it was a real success. Um, in fact, it was such a success that the audience demanded a second uh, performance. And so it was the first one of the odd pieces that's played twice before it's ever composed. So I'll play a little bit of the opening. <laughs> It's a really beautiful piece, and um, we're very, very lucky to have it. Sadly, Punto and Beethoven fell out soon after this, the clash of egos maybe, and so the tour of uh, concerts had to be cancelled. But um, maybe they fell out because Beethoven was getting more and more concerned about his hearing. Um, he went to his doctor, and his doctor said, well, look, go to a quiet town outside of Vienna, a little place called Heiligenstadt. And so uh, Beethoven went there, and while he was there, he wrote a letter to his brother Karl, um, saying how he felt almost suicidal about his loss of hearing. For any musician, this would be a really tragic thing. But also something happened in Heiligenstadt which turned Beethoven around. And um, he decided that he wasn't happy with any of his music so far, uh, which is quite an astonishing thing to say. Um, but he wanted to go in a new direction and take music in a new direction. His art was most important. He was going to take life by the throat and go with it. And so he really did move on. And so we come to his third symphony, which for the horns is a really, really important moment. Um, his first and second symphonies were wonderful, gorgeous pieces, but of their own, basically, grand classical symphonies. The third symphony has three horn parts, very unusually, and um, each part is really fun to play. Each part shows a reflection of the meeting with Punto, and it's got chromatic hand horn work. This was new. Um, they work separately, wonderful parts separately and together as a section famously in the trio. And it's a wonderful move forward. Beethoven brought horns forward as a section in, of their own and really forward in the music too. So it's really hero heroic playing. In his fifth symphony, he went even further to be heroic. It's quite amazing the tunes he gives to the horns, such power and such drive. It's wonderful. And talking of drive, the seventh symphony with its just compulsive movement forward um, Wagner listened to it and he called it the apotheosis of the dance. Um, I'd like to think that it's actually a reflection of the Industrial Revolution which was happening around that time, the power of the steam engines driving forward that incessant energy. But what was interesting for the horns was Beethoven used a very high crook, much smaller than this one, and he, that wasn't unusual of itself, but the way Beethoven used it, he asked for it to play, be played really, really loudly, and that gave such a bright, exciting sound to the piece. Um, that it's quite astonishing. It's very hard work and really dangerous, but it is amazing. It's one of his finest pieces. And then we get on to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Now, in this, for the horns, it's very famous for having a big, big solo for the fourth horn. And uh, it goes down to one bar in which the fourth horn, everything stops and the fourth horn just plays a scale up and down, which is quite strange of itself. But there's been a lot of conjecture over the years as to whether this was written for this instrument or for a piston horn. 
Now the pistons had been invented back in 1812 by Heinrich Stolzl, and they were around, but the horn players tended to use them. They put a piston down and then proceeded with the hand technique they were used to. Now it's quite possible, and it works quite well on the piston horn to play that solo, but there are aspects of it which reflect back, for me, reflect back to Beethoven's time with Punto, the arpeggio work in it, which Punto was famous for, the bottom G, which Punto was also famous for, in which you have the bends at the bottom C down a fourth, and that's a very long way down. And towards the end, uh, there's parts of it which um, I think Brahms took up later in his first symphony, that big heroic sound of the horn just coming through, and it was given to the fourth horn, who is a player right out on the edge, and this is another question, why the fourth horn? I tend to think that being a player right on the edge of the orchestra, it was almost harking back to that hero, that romantic hero, who was fighting against the mob, a bit like Beethoven hoped Napoleon would be at the time of the Third Symphony. So there are so many aspects of that movement we reflect back to that time of the Third Symphony and Beethoven's um, fight with Napoleon's downfall and things like that, and his work with Punto. And that show goes on to say that other composers are so influenced. As I said, Brahms used that famous big horn solo, suddenly everything stops and it's this lovely horn sound, very heroic. And that comes, I think, from that period in Beethoven's life, the Beethoven 9 solo. And it makes you think, what would have happened without Beethoven? For the horn, the horn was developing. It had been before Beethoven came and the piston came along, it was developing afterwards. But Beethoven's writing for it also developed and made it into a much more strong and heroic instrument. And without that, what would Be Brahms' music been like? What would have Mahler's, what would Strauss's music been like? And even John Williams nowadays. So without Beethoven, I don't think we would be where we are nowadays and we owe a great debt to him.